Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Zon Academy. Today's webinar is Business Strategies, New Process Introduction Workshop. This is the first of a two-part session. The next session will be on Wednesday, August 17th, and is open for registration. Today's presenters are Larry Weiss and Dell Dine of Weiss Advisors. Larry and Dell wish this to be an interactive session, so please type in any questions that you have at the bottom of your screen with the Q&A icon. We'd like everybody to enjoy today, and here is Dell and Larry. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, good afternoon. We'd like to thank Zahn and Zahn Academy for this opportunity to share today's content. All of us have been and will be faced with changing processes, systems, and products in our material in the future. Today, we want to look at a process that I used extensively at Keller Dental Lab as we grew it from a 10 person to over 200 employee lab and improve the oral care of hundreds of thousands of human beings and provide six decades of employment for hundreds of employees who had worked at Keller while providing meaningful work for them. And to start off, Dell, talk a little bit about your background and kind of how you use this in your days at National Dentex. Uh, certainly. Um, again, my name is Dell Dine. Um, I spent uh, well over 30 years in the dental laboratory industry, and the bulk of it certainly was with National Dentex. I mean, besides owning my own laboratory, that is where I uh, cer certainly learned um, most about you know managing a business and business strategy. Um, and then most recently, I've signed on with Larry, where um, we've uh, kind of teamed up, and then we're trying to help laboratories um, you know, develop uh, you know, their uh, processes to improve their uh, profitability. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the great thing about National Dentex was in the, the development of it. Um, Dave Brown used to say that, you know, we do something very well uh, in most of our laboratories. The problem is we don't do it very well in all of our laboratories. And then so that they kind of embarked on a, a process of best um, best practices. And then I have to say, you know, Keller, when we purchased Keller, probably was by far and away the, uh, the laboratory that introduced us to the most disciplined and complete processes relative to um, putting a new product out um, and then reaping the benefits of doing that. I mean, Larry, I mean, you guys had a goal of a uh, new process or uh, new products of what, four years or something like that? Yeah, we want, actually wanted... Um products introduced within the last five years to represent at least 30% of our revenue. So we were always looking at either new product or repackaging existing products to appeal to a greater audience. Yeah, so I learned a tremendous amount from Larry and all the folks at Keller. And then uh, that's what we're trying to bring to you here today. Thanks, Dal. A uh, little bit about myself. Um, Dell had mentioned uh, we knew each other for years before National Dentex acquired Keller. Uh, the about three years ago, I left Keller and have been working now with privately owned labs and lab owners around the country. Dell joined late last year. Uh, we really enjoy sharing what we've learned, and and you saw in Dell's bio there, he's part owner of a microbrewery which if we're ever in the same city together, you'll generally find us at a microbrewery because the, uh, we, we both we both enjoy uh, uh, malts and hops and we're also fond of grapes too. So um, the uh, hopefully we'll see you somewhere out in our travels across the country. So let's um, let's talk a little bit about today. So what we're... Today is, as Fran had mentioned, it's really part one of a two-part series. But before we dive into the program, what I'd like you to do is just to make sure everybody can find the Q&A tab, type in the most unusual job you've ever had, either in the dental lab industry or outside of it. And the goal is to beat, to, to do better than what my first job was 
which was a, as a pre as a early teenager, 12, 13, 14, I had a summer or actually had a weekend job where I was the pooper scooper at a dog kennel down not far from the house. So I'd hop on my bike right over there every Saturday and Sunday, spend a couple hours cleaning out the um, pens the dogs were in. So hopefully somebody out there can come up with something that was even more exciting or grosser than what I was doing. So Fran, if you would monitor that, we'll kind of see if we uh, make sure everybody can find the Q&A tab. And my guess is we have some pretty unusual things out there. Absolutely, Larry. So while you guys are thinking, while you guys are working on that, um, today's session, what we want to do is we're going to go through some content and some material and kind of call it the theory part of this class. And we want to begin with a SWOT analysis. And we're going to move on then to talk about goals, planning, and execution. And as Fran had mentioned when we started, is please do ask questions. Uh, I like these, I like the in-persons, personally, I prefer the in-person because it's, it's easier to be interactive. Here, you've got to type a little bit. Uh, Fran promises not to judge any or all of our misspellings. So um, well, let's get started, Del. Awesome. So before we look at why you want to add a product or a process or the benefits of changing one, Let's talk about the SWAT tool. And SWAT stands for strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, what I hopefully many of you have used this in your current lab, in your current lab or in a prior life. And if you haven't, well, you really want to think about it. I, this is something you can Google it, get more detail on it, but it truly is a tool that can be used in a lot of different ways. Larry, I, I like to think of the SWOT uh, process is kind of, you know, checking the foundation. Um, so like in your uh, house, um, if you're upstairs and you see a big crack in the wall, you go downstairs and see what the foundation is, you know, where it's failing. And then so in the SWOT process, we kind of, you know, just do a little bit of analysis into the health of our, our business. Um, and then in, in laboratories, you know, I think some of the, you know, you think about what your foundation is. Foundation is, you know, can you um, can you manufacture it? Um, can you uh, market it? You know, can you get it there? Can you deliver it on time? Um, so, you know, this SWOT analysis really helps un uncover uh, anything that, you know, you, uh, you sort of feel good about and the things that you wish you were doing a little better. And Dell, you're right on the mark there. And the, the other thing or the one of the things I like about this tool is you can use it in many different ways. You can look at your entire lab. You can look at a specific department. We actually even used it to look at individual products. Uh, we used it to take a look at our, as we developed our sales and marketing strategy, and even with some employee issues or HR issues that we came across. And the, the flexibility of it is amazing. And what's key as you do that is you have to be honest. So we're, we'll show you a template here in a little bit that we go, that we can use to help with this, but it's imperative you be honest. If you answer the questions to make yourself feel good or look good, you're gonna come up with the wrong strategy. And the other thing I really encourage you to do too is you wanna involve the appropriate team members. Don't just have the owners get together or don't just have a group of like-minded team members work on it. And you want folks from across the lab that do different things. And if it at all touches the customer, I really encourage you to get some customer feedback. Whether they sit in on the whole exercise or not, that's kind of up to you. But understanding how the customer sees what we do is just huge. And as you go through the process, just gather the information on the first pass. Don't criticize, don't challenge, just record it. And eventually you do this enough, some employee, somebody's gonna come up with something that's just way off base or doesn't make any sense, 
write it down, and then when you go back, you can vet it later and decide which items apply. Dell, anything else you want to add on that? No, I just think that reaching out to your clients, you know, if you could even get, you know, some of your lost clients to kind of divulge the, uh, you know, why they, you know, why they left you, uh, it'll tell you volumes about, you know, maybe something that you missed um, or something that you just kind of overlooking that is important to your client base. So I can't underscore enough of just, you know, getting out and kind of getting your uh, clients in, involved in this process because um, it really helps you get a, a, a cleaner perspective on it for sure. And what Dell said is really important too, that just don't call good customers. I really, some of the best conversations I had were with customers who had left us maybe six months to a year. They still weren't really, they, they had kind of calmed down and oftentimes they forgot why they got mad at me. But the good thing of that is they had been with their other lab long enough that they did something to aggravate them. And it always surprised me how frequently conversations like that would and would, would result in those lost customers actually sending us some cases back. Yeah, I'll underscore that for sure. So when we think about SWAT, the first two letters are strengths and weaknesses. And this is really a great place to start. It's what are you good at? What do you do well? And as important are what are your weaknesses? That the where can you improve? And <clears throat> we'll decide later whether you want to spend time building on strengths or whether you want to spend time focusing on strengths or trying to build your weaknesses. But understanding those two are imperative because oftentimes we'll embark on a strategy within the lab that we just flat don't have the resources to do. Yeah. I think back to Keller, yeah. when implants started really taking off, we didn't really have, we didn't have that real strong individual to lead that. And as we thought about how do we get into the implant business, what we realized is uh, the first thing we needed to do was to get somebody that really understood that product line and that business. And we spent some time, unfortunately, trying to get involved without that person. And what we found is Customers liked working with us because of the resource we were. And what we discovered pretty quickly is we weren't a resource there. No, another thing I'd like to add real quick, Larry, before we leave this, you had this, uh, you had the no log, which I tell you, you, you keep that for a month or two. It is very enlightening. Well, that, yeah, that was one of my favorite tools. And that actually came from one of our uh, customer experience representatives. And, and I was having a meeting every now and then I would just pull a group of employees together and just have lunch with them, bring in pizza or Subway sandwiches. And the one day I asked, what can we do better? And uh, one of the really young gal had only been with us about three months said, you know, when I answer the phone, I get a lot of questions about why we didn't do something. And I said, that's interesting. I hadn't heard that. I go, what do you tell them? She goes, I don't really have an answer for them. And I said, well, how often do you, how often do you get that question? She goes, well, at least once a week, somebody's not happy with it. So what we started doing was everybody, anybody who took phone calls from customers just wrote down anytime they said no. What was it? And a little detail. So the, many of the calls involved, can I get a pickup today? Well, our drivers already left that area and they're on the other side of town, so no. Or just whatever it was. And it turns out the, the point that this, the, new young, the, the new young employee had brought up, probably 20 years earlier, the founder of the company, George, who had retired 10 years prior to this, had told the person who answered the phone, I will never do this. So for 10 years, we've been telling customers no, and all based on something that the original founder had said 10 years earlier. And the fact is we didn't have a problem doing it today. So just that simple 
keeping track of that and looking at that just helped us. It was a weakness we had. And changing that really turned it into an opportunity because it was a, it was a feature that customers really wanted to get. Thanks for reminding me of that, Dell. That was good. Oh, that was a good one. Yeah. The, uh, the last two, the O and the T, are opportunities and threats. And opportunities I like because especially today in the dental lab, things are changing so fast. And as you visit with your customers or you talk with your customers, or if it's an internal team thing, there's a lot of things we can do that really bond us or bring us closer to, to our customers and our team. And the more of those we can do, there's just so many advantages. And then likewise on the threats, how many of us would have thought a pandemic was a real risk to the dental world? And come, what was that, March of 2020, the ADA tells all dentists they should close their office for an indefinite period of time. And I think that just highlights, I can't imagine hardly anybody had done any planning around what happens if all the dentists go home the same day. So thinking about threats and whether you, you may or may not be able to come up with contingency for all of them, but at least understanding or thinking about some of those risks can be a huge benefit. So this slide is one, and, and this is something that I encourage you to just jot down on a piece of paper and just think of it as a box, the SWOT analysis. You take your sheet of paper, and you've got four quadrants, strengths go in one, weaknesses next to it, opportunities underneath the strengths and the threats. And this simple tool just allows you to make all of these notes. And after you go through the exercise, then you can take the time to clean it up and say, let's take two or three items in each box. And in doing that, Created a, you've created a real simple picture of what's your lab really good at? Where are we exposed? What are some things we're not doing that we could do? And what are some threats that we may not have thought enough about? And as you think about strengths, I caution you not to say, we are a responsive quality lab with pickup and delivery. Because in 30 plus years in the lab business, I never met a lab technician that said, you know, we really don't do very good work. We don't listen to our customers and we don't really care if we pick work up or not. So it's, as you think about these, come back to that, be honest and be specific. Dell, any thoughts? Yeah, the one thing I loved about this, Larry, is because as we go through this, that we have to communicate across a, a broad group of people in our laboratories, from the person that delivers the case, to the sales staff, to the managers talking to the clients, to the, the girl that, uh, or just the uh, office person uh, fielding the phone calls coming in and scheduling. And then so that we're gonna have to tell them why they wanna change, why we have to change something. And it gives you an opportunity, in kind of a very graphic way just to communicate what the urgencies are and what you're thinking. So I think of this as a communication tool that I can use just across the, the, the multiple disciplines of the people in the laboratory that has to deliver that change and uh, or a new product. And I think what might be worthwhile here is to take a couple minutes. And I know as, as lab owners or managers, we're reluctant to um, sort of open up our kimono to share this sort of information. But my guess is everybody on the call is familiar with Glidewell Dental Lab. So it, it, if Del and I were doing this together and we had some other folks in the room, oh, Del, what would you say Glidewell strengths are? What are they, what, what can they do that's really special? Well, I think what they do is really special is they take a, a large amount of work. They turn it around very fast, but they have people that you can talk to on the phone that are CDTs 
and they can, you know, they listen to you um, and then they can deliver it. I think they do that very well. Yep. And, and I think as uh, when we were at Keller, we, we viewed Glidewell as competition. We were so small. I doubt if he worried too much about us, but what we as on a weakness standpoint, as we being in the Midwest, we could actually deliver better service and more personalized service than he could in that certain geography. So we actually targeted areas that were further from Glidewell than they were from St. Louis, where we were located. And we also went after those dentists who were more interested in having a more personal conversation because we weren't trying to deal with whatever his 80,000 or 100,000 dentists. We had a much smaller group and that was much more, much more personal. So if, if, if we think about Glidewell, what do you, Del, what would you think some of their opportunities are? And, and I mean, the reality is we kind of see them take advantage of those every day. You mean that how Glidewell sees the opportunities? Uh-huh. Yeah, I think Glidewell sees the opportunities um, of providing a, a very reasonably cost product. Um, it doesn't compete necessarily with China, um, but they get into areas that you are know, not serviced as well as they could be um, or should be probably. And then so they, um, they capitalize on that. They, they do their research. They know where those uh, mailings and that type of marketing is going because they know what the opportunity there is. I, and I think that's, that's, how, that's how we want, as we look at ourselves and we look at our lab, that's the reasoning or that's kind of the process we want to go through. And then again, threats for Glidewell are if a, if, if a dentist wants to have a live interaction, they really can't do that. So one of the things, actually National Dentex and Glidewell were pretty good friends. And in talking with Jim, he would, he would frequently say, the thing you guys have that I don't is that personal interaction. He said, we don't have a shade room. We don't really even have a, we don't have a reception area for customers. Nor do Our we reception. want one. Yeah, nor do we want one. We don't do pickup and delivery. So he said, I know there's a segment of the market that I can never serve, that you guys serve very well. And, and that's where as business people, the threats aren't always negative. They're just things that we want to manage or be aware of. So if, if that triggers any questions by anybody, please feel free to enter those in the Q&A and uh, Fran will share those with us. But hopefully uh, kind of doing that works. I mean, it helps you picture, okay, where are we? And, and I think as a really any size lab, if we want to grow, using this tool to help us understand What's that intersection between what we're really good at and what our customers want us to do more of? So as uh, looking at the business process change or looking at new materials or new products, we now have our SWOT analysis done. So we have our one page summary here of what are our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities and our threats. What we really wanna do then is we wanna move on to what I will call the second part of the process. And this is why do we wanna make a change? So let's talk about, or let's think about what are our strategies? I mean, why do we, why do we want to change something? And this is a point where you look at your SWOT analysis and you start to brainstorm possible objectives and goals for the change. If you're making a change because you don't have the depth, let's say you're, you've been looking for a setup technician now for as some of us, as some of you have probably for the last 18 months. And the process or the change you're looking at requires extensive skills in setup. 
does it make sense to consider bringing that product in? Because to be successful, most likely you're going to have to develop up the technical ability first. And then another kind of another example of that is for the labs, for the labs that aren't doing implants or aren't doing all on X cases, would it make sense to launch an all on X product that requires deep implant knowledge and or chair side conversion if nobody in your lab knows how to do those. So this is, as you think about the objectives and goals, these are some things that I think are, at least in my past, and, and Dell, I'll have you weigh in too, changes we made, often we're looking at one of these. We, we wanted to grow our sales. We wanted to grow our customers. A turnaround time was something that we always spent a lot of time trying to figure out, how do we go faster? And nowadays, as Dell and I work with laboratories, probably one of the most frequent things we come across is, I wanna be more digital. I'm tired of all the analog processes. How do I replace those and how do I get to digital? And what we, what we see very frequently is the lab's just not as profitable. Uh, the owners, the managers, they're looking at what they're doing and we're busting our ass, but we just aren't, the income's not there based on the effort we put in. So these are really unique to your lab and, and kind of tell us, what are some things you think that a lab may want to accomplish that we may not have on the list here or, or that you've talked with clients about? Well, the one thing I can, I'll speak to what is on the list, and I think it, it's kind of a sleeper, so that's why I wanted to underscore this, but it's increased the digital capabilities, because the one thing I noticed early on when we were beginning to develop um, digital capabilities within National Dentex, that management got a lot more complex, because now you had the analog process to manage, you had the digital process to manage, and then you had to figure out how to work between the two of them, because it, you know, it wasn't 100% digital. And then that process had to get managed. I mean, it became uh, quite the challenge. And so if you can take and then get things all, you know, kind of gathered up in one, you know, one process to manage, um, you, you get some efficiencies there. You don't, you can do that with less people. So I think that's, you know, that's a, that's a big one. I mean, that is a, a, a worth pursue. And if you can kind of get to those products, um, you know, with, with digital, then you're again, underscore just got yeah, one process to manage for sure. Um, some of the things, for example, and it, it Trusana uh, comes to mind is it might be just reducing tooth stock. <laughs> you know what I mean? There is a lot of different, you know, aspects to this that if you kind of think about it, it touches your laboratory and maybe any one of them is not necessarily worth pursuing, but if you can kind of line a few of these up, you can get some, uh, you can get some efficiencies for sure. No, thanks, Del. And part of that is, as we look at the strategies, what I like to do then is to really go a little deeper and we start to assign some objectives to those strategies. So if we think about why we wanna make this change, here's a list of some reasons to introduce a new product or why a process should change. And in this kind of ways, this kind of points to what Der Dell had mentioned, convert existing analog processes to digital. And we know the digital tend to be faster. Oftentimes it's easier to scale. Uh, oftentimes the learning curve is different and often faster. Uh, for a lot of us, you know what? We're already working with so many dentists in our area and we don't really want to expand our footprint. But if we offer a different product, we can sell those customers more of what we have, or we can probably find some new ones. Kind of come back to the profitability and, and the ability to scale faster. So we think of high level strategies and then we start to assign some objectives or bullet points to those. On the others, Larry, on this one, it, it, there can be things, for example, 
that if you're uh, looking at um, new accounts, let's say, is to target new accounts that are on your uh, delivery route. Because uh, the best way to, you know, to reduce your delivery expense is to, uh, you know, pick up and deliver more work on that route. So that there's a lot of, you know, you kind of think through this, that there's a lot of things that, you know, you can pull together to impact the profitability of your laboratory. And one of the things that I, I hear a lot about now is, especially with the complexity of implants, that a lot of labs have really aligned themselves with a really strong implant rep and their ability to do cross uh, kind of cross referrals and to help each other sell, I see as really a big revenue driver for many of for many of the small and medium sized labs. So I think it really is the the idea of the change can be pretty broad and it's really what makes your life easier. And as we take those strategies and objectives, one of the things that most often, the, the biggest problem that we come across on the lab side is we do a good job of thinking about what we want to do. We do a good job of talking about what we want to do, but we're not so good at executing. And our, I believe our inability to execute really comes back to either our inability or our fear of making commitments. So uh, this is just a real simple chart that with this change, I wanna get new customers. I wanna convert customers. So if we look at, we set a goal to say, okay, how many customers do I have today? How many new customers do I wanna get in 90 or 180 days? You, you pick the time cycle, but have it be such that you can monitor your progress and the period short enough that if you're not on track, what do you do different? I wanna grow revenue per month. Uh, we can come back on the manufacturing side. Um, I think back to my Keller days and one of the things we were challenged with in our St. Louis market is we had a couple new labs start up that they were turning around product a lot faster than we were. So what we decided is we wanted to shorten our turnaround time. And as we looked at that, it's okay. Our fixed at the time were eight days in lab. We want to get to four. And the process is, uh, we changed incrementally, and for about every 60 days, we took one day off that turnaround time. So starting at the beginning of the year, by the time we were through summer, our Crown and Bridge were no longer taking eight days in lab. We were getting over 90% of it done in four days. So it's the the goals here can be many, and they can be they could be all sorts of things. Um, Various times we would have so much overtime that it was just killing the employees. I mean, for a while they like it because it helps them get caught up on their bills or some of them would have their down payment for their bass boat or whatever it is they wanted to get. But eventually it wore them out. So we had a couple different initiatives where we just wanted to get overtime in, in control that we most of the employees could work 40 hours a week rather than having to work more than that so as you think about that what you really want to do is with whatever it is we want to accomplish you want to write it down because underscore we, underscore yeah it's kind of like the the bing 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 if we don't write it down and we don't measure it and we don't track it Three months, six months from now, we're going to be sitting there going, you know, I think we did okay. We did this and this and this. And you really want somebody on the team and in the lab to say, no, you told me we were going to eliminate overtime and we didn't do that. You said we were going to get 10 new customers. We didn't do that. So 
we're just kind of blowing smoke here to tell ourselves we did a good job. Now you want to talk a little bit about how much fun that was at National Dentex with 40 plus labs to try and work through? Yeah, it's like they say, herding cats. Boy, getting, and, and that's why I was underscoring write it down because yeah, it gives you something concrete that you can come back and visit uh, for yourself as much as anything. But to build those milestones in, the one thing that I really sort of felt like it was kind of shared between many of the laboratories, those milestones weren't concrete and then they didn't get visited uh, like they needed to. And then so that all it does is you get to that milestone, it's kind of like keeping score. You know, you, you did or you didn't. And if you didn't, okay, what do I have to do to fire this back up again? Because it's so easy to get drawn back into the business. You got sliding priorities. Um, you get drawn back into the business and then you got to get back out and re-energize and keep that project moving forward. A few of the labs that we work with, probably their biggest gains and what helped management or the owners the most was reducing the number of cases that were rescheduled at the last minute. So I, I can think of a couple labs that we went into that uh, the end of the day, any of you that have the, kind of the management books on scurry and flurry, uh, the mice that were running around, if you walk into your, if, if you're in your lab at the end of the day, and there are people scurrying around looking for cases and then handing them to you or someone else to say, hey, we're not going to have this ready for tomorrow. And you look at it and it's kind of like it hasn't even been in the centering oven. When did why did you decide to bring it to me at four o'clock when most likely the dentist isn't going to be in the office anymore? So it, it really is when you record it. The other thing I'm big we're big fans of is post it. Put it on a whiteboard, put it on a sheet of paper where everybody can see it. So I think of one of the labs we started off, they were rescheduling probably 20 fixed cases a day at the end of the day. And customers were starting to get mad. So we just put a big post-it board up right when you walked into fix. Cases rescheduled yesterday. And just the mere the, the act of doing that and focusing on that, now if they have two cases a day rescheduled, that's a lot. And those tend to be because something either misfired or mismilled or something just happened that was beyond their control. But the, the end result has been everybody in shipping and receiving is much happier. The owner's a lot happier. The lady that makes all of the phone calls on cases aren't going to be there on time is much happier. And suddenly they found they've got much more time now because the last hour or two of the day, they're not running around trying to figure out how to recover from something that went wrong. Yeah, I think you have to find the things that you keep score on, uh, like you're talking about reschedules to keep score on, remakes you can keep score on, cases out of the department um, is just so helpful in kind of aligning your folks. And then when you think about it, if you didn't keep score, nobody would go to a ball game. You wouldn't go there just to watch them play. So it's kind of it gets people involved in this. That's why they want to be there and be a part of it. And they want to celebrate the wins with you. Yeah, it's, and, and I think another thing that we see a lot of times is we go into a lab and it's, we have a problem in our ceramics or our finishing area. Everything comes out late. Well, inevitably, as we go deeper into that issue, most often the problem starts in that the case didn't get scanned and designed when it was supposed to. And they got backed up, which basically means every subsequent step is behind schedule. So what, what starts as I have a problem with QC and, and polishing or glazing often ends up being, you know, I've had cases are sitting in the model room for a day or two, or they're sitting in scan and design for a day or two. And then suddenly now it's really rushed. So score keep and track it. 
So now if we think about what we've done so far, we've done our SWOT analysis. We kind of came up with some strategies based on that SWOT analysis and, and what our customers want or what our team wants. And we built some objectives. And as we start to lay out the execution plan, what I encourage you to do is to think in at least four areas. As we think about a change, think about it from a marketing and customer perspective. Think about it from systems and operations. Thinking about it from people and training. And then innovation and development. Every change won't touch all four of those. But what you want to do is, and again, you want to write it down. Does this change affect customers or marketing? And if it does, what do I need to be aware of? Systems or operations. So just kind of some examples here. If we're going to convert customers, who do we think we can convert? Who are prospects? If, if you personally aren't handling all the phone calls and the queries, provide a script. It's one of the most successful things we did at Keller is we started spending time with our delivery drivers. So when they walked into an office and they got a question, we pretty much gave them, here's a script that use your own words, but the four most common things you're asked or you hear or dentists complain about, you've got some response and then who to connect them to. They loved it. Uh, you, you can see the notes too. I mean, systems. What do we need to train? What equipment do we need to buy? I remember early on, we bought some specialized equipment and it arrived in no clue it required. It was a 208. It was a, instead of a 220 volt system, it was a 208. It wouldn't work on any of our standard wiring. So suddenly the whole project got pushed back as we had to go get an electrical contractor to come in and set the thing up so it would run properly. People in training, who does it affect? We need training plans. We need a communication plan. And this is one, uh, this is one I aired on several times and finally realized probably the most important thing I should do with any of these changes is communicate to the team. You gotta have a plan. And where I fail most often is I didn't anticipate how team members were gonna react to things. And the change, why is it good for them? What's in it for them? Why should they make the change? And is it, you know what? You're gonna learn a new skill you're going to do less tedious steps. This is great for your job security. As you learn more, you're more valuable. And with some of these changes, be honest. I mean, job security in the future for laboratory techs is tied to their willingness to learn and adapt to new products. You may want to finish gold crowns, but uh, we're not selling those anymore. You may not like grinding on zirconia, but that's what most labs are selling now. So it's it's be honest, be upfront, and over communicate. That it's sometimes I would feel like a broken record, and inevitably I sit down in the lunchroom, and an employee would ask me a question: How come I didn't know we were doing this? And I'm sitting there thinking, I know we had at least ten presentations on that, so you almost can't repeat it too often. Do you have anything you want to add on those? Uh, yeah, I just that that whole communication is kind of thinking, you know, who all is going to be communicating. One of those things, about, for example, uh, across uh, development uh, team uh, communication plan is a lot of the disciplines in the laboratory today um, aren't all done in the same department. So that it's kind of like, you know, when you did a, a, 
a partial and Crown Bridge had to make a, a crown abutment that accommodated the partial. You needed some communication between there so that the crown was correct. Um, gosh, you know, when you're getting so much designed in the CAD department and it's going either out to fixed or out to removable, um, there has to be, you know, some very routine communication so that they're getting what they need to complete the case. So that's a big one in all of this, especially if you're changing processes. And so they've got to you know, understand, you know, what's changing in that process. And I think you touched on it um, in that people don't change just they just don't like change in general. I got to maybe just state it that way. I mean, for the most part, you'll find some people who are ambivalent about it, but nobody just runs and says, OK, hey, can we change stuff here? They like their routine. And, and so that you have to kind of help them understand why they're doing it and talk through how it impacts them, because uh, they're just going to think the worst. They just do. Um, and then uh, kind of the last thing is that, you know, that especially with, you know, the, the great lab software we have today, uh, when you're scheduling a case, if you're changing some things, you've got to visit the recipes and make sure that you've allotted, you know, time in that process adequately so that when you schedule it, it's, it's going through the right places, they're doing the right steps, and it's coming out on the other end uh, when it's supposed to. No, thank you, Dell. Those are those are really good points. So as we thought about these four areas, what's key, what what becomes that it's let's set those 90 day priorities, 180 day priorities. Let's get the team on board with your plans for change. You may have been thinking about this for months and working on it, but when I sprang it on the team on Monday to happen Tuesday, they just needed time to process too. If it's a sales thing, who are those customers? Who's responsible? How do we score keep that? If, if we're not getting the customers, how do we figure it out is, is our messaging bad? Is our approach wrong? What's happening that we're not getting them? If we're buying new equipment, do we have everything we need? Materials, train new skills, all of these things. I encourage you to set up that 30, 60, 90, how many ever day timeline you need to, because by doing that, if you're behind schedule at 30, you've got time to catch up at 60. If you don't score keep it until 90 days are up, most likely you're done. You're just not going to get there. So I really encourage you. It's I was a big fan of whiteboards. I always had one right by my desk. And you know what? The more I wrote on there and the more it's just visible to everybody, it sort of, it, it just reinforces that. And if I was behind schedule or we were behind schedule, everybody could see. So when I called for the all hands on deck session, nobody was really surprised. So the old adage here is there's only one way to eat an elephant, and that's one bite at a time. And a lot of these changes we want to make are significant. And just keep that in mind, one bite at a time. And if your plans aren't written, agreed to, and shared, you're not going to get there. I mean, every now and then you might get lucky, but it's just not going to happen that I think one of the things, if you've ever had the opportunity to listen to any of the, uh, the Navy SEALs or some of the special forces folks that present at some of these business programs now, that post-op assessment is critical. What did we say we were gonna do? How did we do? And what did we either do good or bad? And we keep building on that, we keep recording it. Because our goal isn't really just to do well in this project, it's to develop this innate skill internally, that we are always consistently improving and being more successful. So uh, along with that, uh, a couple things that I found very helpful that we developed at Keller, we really with the help of the team, was there's two decision tree processes that we used. And I always found it best when any change I wanted to implement, 
it needed to be aligned with our lab's vision and values. I don't care what you call them, mission, vision, values, guiding principles, whatever they are. But if I embarked on something that wasn't aligned with our vision and values, why would I invest the time to make the change? So at Keller, anything we did needed to align with our vision and value. And then we had two sets of foundational hurdles. Earlier, Dell had talked about the kind of the basement and the, the foundation for the house. The two that we use that always proved valuable for us were a new product that required investment of time or money, it needed to be saleable, scalable, and profitable. We needed to be able to sell it. When we sold it, we needed to be able to make it. And when we made it, we needed to, we wanted to make more money on it than the older product it replaced. And then the second was something that came from Gordon Christensen. In the old days, when Dell and I started, better, faster, cheaper was sort of the mantra. If you could do two of the three, you could win. What I believe, and, and I completely agree with Dr. Christensen on this one, is to be successful today, you've got to do all four. Better, faster, cheaper, and newer. And cheaper doesn't necessarily sell for a lower price. I like to think of it probably more as value. And the newer generally is what allows us to get back to the saleable, scalable, and profitable. And these processes, in my, for my benefit, were really helpful. That as we, over the, over the decades I was involved in the lab, we used these for, for Keller when we bought the US exclusive rights for NTI. It was an oral device for migraines and for bite splints. Uh, we used it to decide if we should acquire a lab. Probably one of the most challenging things we ever did was when we made the decision to move from building ceramics to pressing ceramics. At the time, you couldn't find a ceramist. If you did, it took 12 years to train a good one. By moving to pressing, we totally, re we totally changed our entire manufacturing process. Bringing in digital. Uh, it's just, those are just some of the things that this type of process can really be instrumental. I, I remember when one of the Kellers came in one day and said, you know, metal frameworks are a pain in the ass. We don't do them well. We have high remakes. Nobody likes to finish them. I want to start promoting flexible partials. Uh, so we had to do some homework to even figure out what a flexible par partial was 25 years ago. We ultimately made the decision to outsource all of our metal frames, take all of our resources into flexible partials, and we more than doubled the profitability and revenue of the department. And then shortly after that, we made the decision that, you know what, a lot of people don't like working with, with Valplast. It was a nylon material. Uh, Duraflex had just come out. It was a polypropylene, had a lot of advantages we made the decision we were going to switch every customer from Valplast to Duraflex. And fortunately, we did that right before the one nylon factory burned down in whatever part of Asia it was, then you could no longer buy Valplast. So it's just, just some things that as, as I look back, the process works. And you don't do it on everything. <clears throat> but if you're going to invest time and money Make it a formal process. Make it worthwhile. Del, anything you want to add as we close here? Uh, no, Larry, I think you covered that one very, very well. Okay. And then I'd like to thank Zahn for sponsoring this and making it available. And I'd like to turn it back to Fran. She has a special deal they would like to share with all of the attendees. Fran? Thank you so much, Larry and Dell. We really appreciate you giving us this very, very important information. 
um, to our attendees, I'm sure it is not falling on deaf ears, very valuable information. And you spoke about getting better, getting faster and being more profitable. Well, sometimes taking your lab to the next level requires an equip equipment purchase to get you there. So you can rely on us to help you get that with our Route 66 financing program. This program requires no payments for six months, and that means no payments until 2023. So please contact your Zon representative for more info on our new Route 66 financing program. I'd like to just remind everybody to remember to register for session two with Larry and Dell. That will be again on Wednesday, August 17th. And you can find the information on Zon Academy for your registration link. Again, I'd like to thank both Larry and Dell for joining us today. And to all of our attendees, thank you so much for trusting us with your education. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, sure. everybody. Glad to help.